Dr. Weinstein is an orthopedic surgeon sports specialist who has extensive experience in using ultrasound for diagnostic and treatment purposes, and we are uh, very fortunate to have him present on MSK Ultrasound. At this point, Dr. Weinstein, I will turn over the presentation to you. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, welcome to those who are on. Uh, as Dr. Patterson said, we're going to do a little primer today on musculoskeletal ultrasound, because in my conversations with uh, most of you, it, it seems like this is a, a, a little bit of a, a mystery to, to most orthopedic surgeons at this point. So I've been using musculoskeletal ultrasound in the office full on diagnostically since 2008. Uh, and as you can see, this is a little screen capture straight from uh, straight from uh, PubMed. And in 2008, there were only 338 published articles on the use of mus uh, ultrasound for musculoskeletal applications. And fast forward to recently, and you can see a six-fold increase uh, it, just in terms of gauging the, the level of interest. What we'd like to try and do today is do a little bit of a basic overview, introduce some ultrasound terminology, um, a brief review on some uh, on how an ultrasound works, although I think we probably all have an understanding of that. What I really want to spend time on today is discussing kind of the advantages of musculoskeletal ultrasound, especially as it compares to our traditional gold standard MRI for orthopedic applications. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what some of the limitations of ultrasound are, and hopefully we can get to some cool case examples. Broadly speaking, we can divide musculoskeletal ultrasound up into diagnostic use and therapeutic use. And I think most everybody here is probably familiar with using this therapeutically for image guided injections in the office. I see that being adopted more and more widely. Uh, but there are other therapeutic applications too that we'll touch on later, including uh, percutaneous tenotomy procedures and cryoablations and some other things. But really what we're gonna spend the bulk of the day talking about is our diagnostic use. So as I'm sure everybody in the audience is familiar, ultrasound works on the principle of echolocation, similar to bats and dolphins and porpoises. We create a sound wave, we reflect it back, uh, and then we listen for the echo and turn that into an image. Diagnostically, we use high frequency, low power sound waves. Uh, and uh, as you all know, this is it's non-ionizing radiation. Although the acoustic waves do cause some thermal and pressure changes in the local tissue as measured by a rise in, in local tissue temperature and cavitation, musculoskeletal ultrasound or ultrasound in general is widely considered safe by a number of worldwide regulatory and governing bodies. And to date, there have been no reported adverse effects caused by the clinical application of diagnostic ultrasound. So again, this is probably a review of, of high school or college physics for most of you, but we oscillate a particle and use its rarefraction principle to propagate a wave. Uh, and that's how we transmit the sound. In practical terms, how does the ultrasound work? It uses very specialized piezoelectric crystals, which are capable of converting electrical to mechanical, or in this case, acoustic energy and back. So the ultrasound machine generates an electrical signal, passes through the crystals, which vibrate, they release a sound wave, and then they listen for the echo of that sound wave and give us an electrical signal back to the machine, which is then converted into an image. In the MRI world, and thanks very much to our eye thingies and, and digital cameras these days, we're used to considering resolution as the number of pixels or the number of dots that we can jam into a CCD or a CMOS sensor, uh, where in general, higher numbers are give us better resolution. 
in ultrasound, we tend to revert to the more pure definition of resolution, which is our ability to discriminate between two distinct points. Uh, apologies, this was meant to be demonstrated in sort of a large audience format, but if you're watching a screen, you can probably all clearly see that these are two separate dots. But as I make those dots smaller, we begin to lose our ability to distinguish that these are actually two separate dots. And if you were sitting in the back of an auditorium, uh, and you were reaching my age, you'd probably be struggling with seeing that these are in fact two distinct dots. So that's the kind of resolution or the definition of resolution that we're talking about for ultrasound. If you look at a modern ultrasound machine, this is what I like to call the anatomy of the, the ultrasound machine. The probes or the transducers are what I consider to be the heart of the machine. Uh, this is where the crystals reside, and this is where the uh, electrical signal gets converted into the acoustic wave and back and forth. Obviously, inside the box will be some software, which I would consider the brains, and that's what is able to interpret the returning acoustic and electrical signals and convert them into an image that we can see. And then almost all modern ultrasound machines have some sort of a console where which allows for human input and allows us for uh, for us to direct the action the transducer typically has a handle a body and a window and really the take-home point here is just at the tip of it is a focusing lens and where the the piezoelectric crystals live uh, so for those of you who are fortunate enough to handle a machine this is actually the expensive part of the machine is the probe. Uh, so we want to take a little care with those, try not to bang them around or drop them because they're actually one of the, the bulk of the cost of the ultrasound machine. The transducers themselves come in a wide variety of, of shapes and configurations. On your left is a phased array transducer, which is typically used in the cardiac world. Uh, because it's able to navigate around the, the rib cage and penetrate deeper structures. The middle transducer is a linear or more typically a variable linear high frequency transducer. And this is really where we spend the, the bulk of the time for musculoskeletal ap applications. This is a higher frequency probe giving us some uh, higher resolution. The curvilinear probes on your right are typically used by our urology, gynecology, and general surgery colleagues to view the intra-abdominal and pelvic organs. But there are some applications for musculoskeletal use as well for deeper structures in larger patients and often used, especially when imaging the, the hip. Another highly specialized musculoskeletal probe is this so-called hockey stick probe, which uses super high frequencies uh, and is really good for very superficial structures in the hands and feet. The take home here is that higher frequencies equate to higher resolution, but come at the cost of less depth of penetration. Similarly, lower frequencies equate to lower resolution, but we can get increased tissue penetration. As we all know, sound travels as energy being transferred from one particle to another, and hence it travels better through a denser medium although it takes more energy to move each particle. And this is why sound travels better underwater than it does through air, as you will all remember from being a kid and swimming in the pool and shouting underwater and having your buddy hear it all the way on the other end. Unfortunately, in clinical application, we can't perform ultrasounds underwater. And so we have to find some transmission medium to help us propagate the sound waves. Most typically we'll use an ultrasound jelly as a, as a sort of substitute for a water medium. Uh, you can also use what we call these semi-solid standoff pads, uh, and they work great for irregularly contoured body parts, such as the, the hands and feet. Uh, and if all else fails, you can run down to Walgreens and grab any sort of soluble medium. We'll talk a little bit or do a brief review on, uh, some of the knobs and switches. If you look at a modern ultrasound machine, there can be a bewildering a, a array of switches and knobs and, and other controls, but really you can break this down into just three main controls that we need to, to get a handle on. 
All machines will have some sort of a gain knob for the audio files in the room. You'll recognize gain as a measure of the attenuation of a sound wave. Well, we're using a sound producing machine. So we measure, so we're able to uh, adjust the gain for the non-audio files. We just call this the volume. And briefly, if you turn the gain up, if you turn the volume up on an ultrasound machine, you'll get a much brighter image for you to see. The second control that we use all the time is the depth control. And this lets us basically set how deep into the body that we want to view the imaging plane. Behind the scenes, this adjusts things like the frequency, the focus range, uh, and the scan rate all for us automatically. And most modern ultrasound machines will just combine this into a macro called the depth control. And then there's usually some sort of focus control, which lets us set a precise focus point for the sound waves so that we can really enhance the, the structure of interest. When handling a probe, I like to think of the imaging plane as coming out of the end of the probe, kind of shaped like a credit card. Uh, and this little schematic will just show that you know, if you're perfectly perpendicular to a tubular structure, you should see a, a round circle. It's important to get the transducer oriented correctly. As you can see here in the, the two middle images, you will get the best echo return when the probe is perpendicular, not to the skin or the body surface, but to the tissue of interest. And that's an important feature in optimizing your ultrasound image and in really being able to see the structure of interest. These are sort of the definition, if you will, of the, the basic movements that we talk about when handling a transducer in the ultrasound world. We talk about sliding it, tilting it, rotating it, and rocking it. And this is all in an effort to, as we saw in the last slide, get the get the sound waves perpendicular to whatever tissue of interest we have. In the MRI world, we are all used to defining our orthogonal imaging planes by our standard anatomic reference planes. We use the terms coronal, sagittal, and axial. And it's important to note that these imaging planes are fixed prior to acquisition of the study. So once the tech lines the patient up in the machine, orients the machine to the patient, they press go, they put their feet up on the console, have another cup of coffee or a Red Bull, and the machine does its thing. In ultrasound, our orthogonal imaging planes are defined by orientation of the tissue of interest. And thus our reference terms are usually longitudinal, meaning we are going with the long axis or in line with the structure of interest, or short axis or transverse, in which case we are going in cross section to the structure of interest. The imaging planes can and usually are adjusted during the scan to maintain our orientation, although we can certainly go off axis if desired, unlike traditional MR imaging. At the end of the day, the ultrasound machine will turn the sound waves into an image that we see on the screen that's displayed in usually one of the 256 shades of gray. Structures, particularly uh, water, which has a high transmissibility and which sound waves penetrate easily, will generate no echo return and thus will show up as black on your screen. And all the way at the other end of the spectrum, structures such as bone, which have a high reflectance rate, will show up as bright white. Most of our musculoskeletal tissues of interest, muscle, ligament, tendon, et cetera, will wind up here in our, somewhere in one of our medium gray zones. In ultrasound terminology, we refer to the middle of the grayscale spectrum as isoechoic, and things that are brighter or whiter will show up as hyperechoic, we call it, and things that are more transmissible or darker will show up as hypoechoic. Just to keep it simple, if you're evaluating a musculoskeletal ultrasound image, too much black is bad and too much white is generally bad. All right, for those who are old enough to remember the David Letterman show, I thought we'd roll a sort of late night top 10 list of reasons why musculoskeletal ultrasound is superior to MRI for orthopedic imaging. Number one, 
There are no patient contraindications to sonography. Number two, ultrasound offers a higher resolution for musculoskeletal tissue structures than MRI. Number three, ultrasound offers real-time dynamic evaluation. Ultrasound allows us to interact with the patients during the examination. There's no interference from prior surgical hardware. The Doppler mode on the ultrasound can provide us some actual physiologic information in addition to our anatomic information. Ultrasound is just flat out better at differentiating fluids from solids. Number eight, ultrasound allows for image guided therapies. Number nine, ultrasound facilitates bilateral comparisons for times when the anatomy is not clear. And number 10, ultrasound offers us a more flexible field of view. We're gonna go ahead and examine each of these in a little more detail so that we can see some practical applications. As I stated, ultrasound is suitable for every patient. There are no patient contraindications. As we all know, MRI can be contraindicated in patients with cardiac pacemakers, aneurysm and or vascular clips. Uh, and while modern devices are now MRI compatible, we certainly have to go through a number of hoops and make sure and check the, the, with the manufacturer to make sure what kind of device the patient has implanted. And of course, MRI still remains contraindicated for those with foreign metal shrapnel debris embedded within their body. Most modern MRI machines have a maximum weight limit of somewhere between 350 and 400 pounds and a maximum girth, at least for a closed bore unit of 60 to 70 millimeters. With ultrasound, we see no issues with claustrophobia since the exam is performed in a typical standard office examination room. And it's been reported in the literature that even with open MRIs, greater than 8% of all patients still cannot tolerate going into a magnet. And of course, with ultrasound, we eliminate the need for any pre-procedural sedation. Ultrasounds are generally considered a more comfortable study. The patient assumes a relaxed sitting or supine posture, and we can avoid any sort of prolonged immobilization, i.e. they don't have to listen to a tech yelling at them for 45 minutes to hold still, hold still, don't breathe. In addition, and I want to really emphasize this point, the patient is able to interact and engage with the sonographer during the exam. This alone helps keep them relaxed and comfortable and helps ensure that we get the study that we desire. And at least in the shoulder world, numerous studies have shown that if you ask the patients, they much prefer to have a musculoskeletal ultrasound to an MRI. Advantage number two, Ultrasound offers a higher resolution for musculoskeletal tissues than MRI. The axial resolution of a 10 megahertz probe, ultrasound probe, which is a very middle of the road probe. Remember, higher frequencies are higher resolution, and this is a very middle of the road probe. The resolution of that probe is about 150 microns. Remember, as we're discussing resolution, our ability to discriminate two points we measure it like a golf score where shooting lower is better. A typical 1.5 Tesla scanner using our standard uh, image acquisition parameters typically yields a resolution about threefold higher than that of the ultrasound. Even with a 3T magnet, we can only get the resolution down to about 250 to 300 microns. So we're still double the range of the ultrasound. And that's gonna come with a penalty of higher acoustic noise, even in our 3T magnets. And I'll throw out a word of caution for most of you when dealing with 3T magnets, because most of our imaging centers spend that bandwidth on decreasing the acquisition time rather than providing the higher quality images. So what we're really getting back is a 1.5 Tesla image and the patient got a 45 minute scan instead of an hour and a half scan and the imaging center got two thirds more patients throughput for the day. <clears throat> that higher resolution I think is ideal for 
tendon, ligament, nerve, and other uh, vascular structures. And if you look closely, the echo architecture that you see on the screen can resemble actual tissue histology. If we look on your left is an image of a distal Achilles tendon inserting onto the calcaneus. The head is off to the left of your screen. Obviously, the bottom of the foot is off to the right. We can see the Achilles tendon here. We can see the streaky fibrillar nature of a relatively healthy Achilles tendon. And if you squint just a little bit, you can imagine that this looks like the dreaded uh, tissue histology slides that we all remember uh, from medical school. As another example, let's look at a median nerve in cross-section as it crosses the carpal canal. On the left is both a histologic specimen and of course a schematic cross-section. And again, we can see that the ultrasound image really resembles what we're expecting to find. We have the epineurium, as you can see here, we can see the individual fascicles, and we can even see some of the individual nerve bundles or nerve fibers within those fascicles. And this gives us a typical ultrasound appearance that we call a honeycombed appearance. Ultrasound is also much better at detecting tiny calcifications, even versus traditional plain films, and is much better at detecting foreign bodies that have been shown that even when we see a foreign body on an ultrasound and we go back and point it out to the radiologist, we still can't find it on an MRI. And here's an example of a 40 year old uh, right hand dominant female malpractice attorney came in to me with a six month history of right lateral elbow pain. Uh, she was treated for several months before she got to me with physical therapy, bracing, and even a corticosteroid injection. You can see her plain films are completely unremarkable. But if we look at the ultrasound images on your right, we can see a not so tiny calcification here within the origin of the common, common extensor tendons. She went on to be treated with a percutaneous tenotomy type procedure, a so-called 10X procedure, and 12 weeks later came in with complete resolution of her symptoms. Ultrasound allows for us to perform a real-time dynamic evaluation. As we all know, MRI is a highly static exam, and in fact, our image quality is degraded significantly by motion artifacts. However, many musculoskeletal abnormalities are not present at rest. Patients come in and they complain of pain, clicking, and they tell you how many times, hey, doc, it hurts when I do this, or you can see this lump when I move in this certain direction. Well, you can't replicate that in an MRI scanner, but we can in a live dynamic ultrasound. In addition, many orthopedic diagnoses implicitly require dynamic motion. When we talk about impingement, whether at the hip or the shoulder or the ankle, that inherently implies some motion path causing a conflict. Similarly, with our diagnosis of snapping hips, tendons, and or nerve subluxations, that dynamic capability also allows us under ultrasound to perform radiographic stress views. Here's an example uh, in the shoulder. So this is a, a humerus. We can see the shaft of the humerus coming down. This is our greater tuberosity and you can just start to see the humeral head here. This is the lateral margin of our acromion and you can see the deltoid attachment coming off that acromion. And right in here is where our supraspinatus is going to live and watch as we abduct the patient's arm, you can see the supraspinatus impinging right there underneath the lateral margin of the acromion. Similarly, in a little bit different view, we have the anterolateral corner of the acromion here. We have the coracoid process here, and you can see a well-defined CA ligament running between them. Underneath here is our humeral head. This is going to be our rotator cuff. Watch as we rotate the arm. You can see the CA ligament bowing out in classic dynamic subacromial impingement. Another quick example in the hip, and just for orientation, this is the femoral head, whereas we're coming out to the neck. This is the capsule of the hip joint. And just as a side point, we can really appreciate just how far down the neck the capsule comes, differentiating intracapsular from extracapsular hip fractures. Uh, but the point on this is to show you as we move 
uh, as we'll see on the next slide, we're going to see the hip impingement. So I want you to just focus on this orientation. This is the same patient, same orientation. So again, we can see the femoral head, femoral neck. Now we can start to see the edge of the acetabulum. And right in here is our acetabular labrum. Same over here. Here's the corner of the acetabulum. We begin to lose the definition of the of the head and neck, but this is basically the same patient, same orientation, and we can focus on the labrum here. As we move the hip, you can see the labrum start to displace. It is being pushed out of the way by flexion of the hip. And similarly here, when we take a, a impingement maneuver in the hip, again, we can see the labrum start to displace. So this is a clear anterosuperior acetabular labral tear evaluated by ultrasound. Advantage number four is our ability to involve the patients in their examination. How many times have we seen a patient come in to the office waving a three-page MRI report, shoving it in our face, and convinced that they're about to die because, oh my God, look at all these findings that are, that are listed here, none of which have anything clinically relevant to do with the patient's presenting complaint. Similarly, another problem uh, I often find in the sports world is that we can order a shoulder or a hip or a, or an ankle exam, and we'll get a standard out of the box MRI exam. They call up their protocol, they punch it in. And again, they let the machine whirl away and the structure of interest will be just out of the field of view of the MRI machine, or you'll see only half of it because no one thought to extend it and follow the pathology. Both of those limitations are easily overcome with ultrasound. We can, can and often do put the ultrasound probe directly over where the patient tells us it hurts. If we get a positive pain response there, we call that positive sonopalpation. This greatly increases our likelihood of detecting a clinically relevant abnormality. And we're able to focus the field of view on what we think think is clinically important, and most importantly, what the patient thinks is clinically important so that they are reassured that their area of concern gets addressed. This is a 23-year-old female competitive downhill skier. She came to me with a greater than one-year history of anterior knee and thigh pain following a fall. She had completed multiple courses of rehab. Ultimately, she underwent a knee scope and patellar chondroplasty for anterior knee pain. This was then followed several months later by a second knee scope for a synovectomy and fat pad debridement, all without relief of her symptoms. Uh, as we look at the ultrasound, just for orientation, you can see the, the anterior edge of the femur. Uh, we're slightly lateral here, so we can see the vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, and this is going to be our rectus femoris. If we shift the probe over just a little bit, we're getting a nice cross-sectional view of our rectus femoris uh, just above the musculotendinous junction with the, with the quadriceps mechanism. And over here on the right of the quad, this is normal, healthy appearing muscle. But right here in a more central to medial location, we see a disorganized, very uniform appearing band of tissue. And this is an area of fibrosis, presumably from her injury. And this correlated directly with the, with the site of her pain. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just scan through here. And as we scan back and forth through the muscle, we can see that that area of fibrosis doesn't really change. This is the same patient, same area. Again, we've just switched to a long axis view. So the patient's hip is off to your left. The knee is off to the right. And this is that same area of fibrosis. And as we scan through that and we can see that we're asking the patient to dynamically contract their quad. We can see that that area of fibrosis doesn't really contract and doesn't really move. We went ahead and performed an open excision of that little fibrotic area. And three months later, she was making a return to elite level competitive training. Ultrasound offers us no interference from prior surgical hardware. As we know, most orthopedic implants are certainly MRI compatible, but that doesn't mean that we don't get significant scatter artifact from our implanted hardware. Ultrasound suffers no such limitation and in fact can offer the advantage of detecting soft tissue impingement underneath somewhat proud hardware.
almost all uh, ultrasound machines include a Doppler mode. Uh, Doppler mode will be familiar to most of you as the famous flashing blue and red circles and the whoosh whoosh sound. That Doppler imaging provides a true vector for flow information, meaning it gives us both a magnitude and direction to the flow. In musculoskeletal applications, we mostly use what we call power Doppler mode in which we sacrifice the directionality in order to increase the sensitivity for detecting the and identifying the magnitude of flow. This makes it much more sensitive. That so-called hyperemia can give us clues to increased biologic activity in conditions such as our inflammatory arthritis. It can help differenti differentiate an acute bursitis. It helps differentiate chronic tendinopathy from an acute tendinitis and is even useful in the detection of an active infection. Advantage number seven, ultrasonography is just flat out better at differentiating cystic from solid lesions. We've all seen MRIs come back with bright T2 signal and a diagnosis of a simple cyst only to try and aspirate it and either get no material out or worse to get blood back from a highly synovialized or vascular malformation. On ultrasound, we can see the internal structure and we can use our, our Doppler mode to see whether there's internal septations. We can identify whether it's truly free fluid or more of a gelatinous cystic material or, and to identify whether in fact the lesion may be something like an AVM, which you want to obviously avoid sticking a needle in. Ultrasound can certainly be used for guiding real-time therapeutic interventions. Under direct ultrasound imaging guidance, this gives us a certainty of hitting our intended target while allowing us to avoid adjacent neurovascular structures. It helps to avoid overpenetration, i.e. we can avoid bouncing the needle off the tendon or bone. We can avoid dry taps from those septated fluid collections. And it also allows for the guidance of some innovative treatments, such as our percutaneous needle tenotomies, our so-called 10Xs or 10Jets. It allows us to lavage large calcific lesions, particularly in the shoulder. And newer applications allow for the sclerosis or cryoablation, particularly of the peripatellar nerves for refractory anterior knee pain. This is a... 47-year-old uh, female, actually operating nurse, came in with calcific tendinopathy of her rotator cuff. Uh, we can see, the again, the humeral head. This is a greater tuberosity coming down to the shaft of the humerus. This is our supraspinatus, the overlying deltoid. And we can see a large embedded calcific lesion within her supraspinatus. She underwent a percutaneous tenotomy or a 10X procedure and came in 12 weeks later, and we can see near complete resolution of all her calcium and more importantly, complete resolution of all her pain symptoms. Here we are just scanning through, ensuring that all the calcium is in fact been debrided. Ultrasound facilitates bilateral comparisons. As we all know, a wide degree of anatomic variability exists within the musculoskeletal system, and it's often useful to detect bilateral asymmetry for deciding whether a finding is normal or abnormal. While this is not impossible with MRI, if you order a bilateral study, the patient is going to basically undergo two complete MR studies and likely be charged twice and spend twice as long in the acquisition unit. With ultrasound, it is not only easy to perform a bilateral comparison, it is in fact considered a standard part of most complete exams and is performed on a near routine basis. When we talk about field of view, MRI actually gets the nod for having a wider field of view than ultrasound. However, once again, that field of view is not very easily changed. It's set as part of the 
study protocol imaging parameters. And once set, the scan goes through and completes at whatever field of view was selected. And good luck if you actually want to try and convince your text to change that field of view from what's preloaded into their machine. On the other hand, ultrasound offers, offers us, although a more narrow field of view, it offers a more flexible field of view. And this allows us to trace long structures throughout their entire course in the body. And this is, has obvious useful applications for our long muscle tendon units, such as the Achilles, or for tracing peripheral nerves, uh, particularly in the upper extremity, our radial, ulnar, and median nerves, where there can often be multiple sites of compression. As an example, here's an Achilles tendon. Again, head is off to your left, bottom of the foot is off to your right. We can see the soleus muscle here, so we know we're up in the proximal third of the calf. We can see the underlying FHL just for reference. We can trace the Achilles tendon all the way distally into its insertion on the calcaneum. And the more astute of you will notice the acute disruption here in this Achilles tendon about three and a half centimeters proximal to its insertion. Those are really the top 10 most widely published advantages of ultrasound. I have a list of a few others that I call Weinsteinisms. Uh, certainly with ultrasound, there's no need for a specialized room or build out. We don't need heavily reinforced concrete floors to hold the weight of a heavy machine. We don't need lead lined walls for an x-ray suite. We don't need a metal free environment for a, an in-house MRI. Uh, other advantages include the fact that ultrasound is in any form is generally considered portable. So we can bring the exam to the patient rather than having to bring the patient to the exam. Ultrasound is certainly a lower cost modality. It uses far less electricity. There's less ownership costs to get into ultrasound, and this translates to overall less cost to both the health system and the patient. Newer ultrasound machines can be brought point of care, uh, which means that they can literally be slipped into a pocket or a briefcase and brought with you wherever you are deciding to provide care. Ultrasound offers a quicker scan time. Most MRI scans will take somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour and a half for routine musculoskeletal applications. We can perform a complete musculoskeletal ultrasound of most body parts, including our bilateral comparisons in about 20 to 25 minutes, which means if you add on a simultaneous physician visit with that, we're getting the whole patient encounter done in less time than it, than it takes to get a typical MRI. For musculoskeletal applications, there's no special prep for the ultrasound. They don't particularly need to be fasting. It doesn't matter whether they have a full or an empty bladder. There's no contrast. There's no pre-imaging blood work to be performed. Uh, and as I previously alluded to, if so desired, one can perform the exam and the physician follow-up in the same office visit setting. There are some limitations to ultrasound. And the most frequently cited is certainly that ultrasound is very operator dependent. It really depends on a good and skilled technician or sonographer to be able to optimize the image and be able to understand what it is we're looking for and bring that out. As we saw earlier in the presentation, you have to be able to get that probe oriented 90 degrees to the structure of interest, not just to the skin. You have to understand your anatomy and be able to follow a structure from proximal to distal or from origin to insertion. Secondly, while there are no patient contraindications to ultrasound, there is just a limited amount of energy available, and that makes it difficult to penetrate to some of the deeper structures in our more morbidly obese patients. doesn't mean we can't try. It just means we will start to suffer some degraded image quality. Ultrasound cannot penetrate bone. So this provides us no ability to see intraosseous structures, and it limits our ability to view intraarticularly as the internal joint structures are often blocked by the bony architecture. However, that same limitation also makes it very highly sensitive for cortical fractures. And 
in other industries, they routinely use ultrasounds to look for fatigue cracks in metal welds, such as in aluminum aircraft frames or steel submarine hulls. And we can use this same property to be very highly sensitive, almost on the order of a CAT scan for detecting cortical fractures. Patients are obviously built differently, and that offers them a different, a differing tissue impedance. This, this means that the same settings on the machine, on the ultrasound machine, may yield different imaging qualities. And again, this comes back to requiring our ultrasonographers and our technicians to recognize this and alter the machine settings on the fly, real time, as we're doing the exam to help us optimize that imaging. In addition, ultrasound suffers from what we call anisotropy. This is a finding that's most obvious with tendons and ligaments being caused by the highly ordered parallel pattern of the collagen fibers. So again, they show the, those collagen fibers show the greatest degree of reflectivity when examined perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. Anisotropy therefore occurs when the ultrasound beam is not perpendicular to that fibrillar structure, resulting in the absence of specular reflectors and an artifactual hypoechoic to anechoic appearance. So you really have to challenge yourself that when you see a dark area in the middle of a tendon or ligament, that it's not a tear and that you, or that it is, or is not a tear and that you're not just missing a section due to this anisotropy effect. And of course, finally, there is a somewhat steep logarithmic learning curve for ultrasound. It takes some time and experience to get comfortable with the interpretation of the, the images. There are obviously some barriers to entry to musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, there's a, a cost to machine acquisition. There's a cost to training. Uh, and you have to compare this to the somewhat decreased reimbursements, uh, especially when talking about our more traditional MRIs. Uh, often, depending on your application and your workflow, you'll need to not only get yourself trained, but you will train a sonographer to actually perform the bulk of the exams. They do take some time. They take some time on your part for, Im for implementation. And of course, there's some archival issues with the images. Uh, although I would say most of us are probably have access to some sort of PAC system these days, uh, really minimizing our, our, our storage issue. This was kind of the learning curve that I followed when we first got into musculoskeletal ultrasound. There are certainly other pathways available, uh, but we went ahead and got ourselves trained up uh, on musculoskeletal ultrasound, attended some courses and seminars, did some practicing. We were then started out by using musculoskeletal ultrasound to confirm our MRI findings. We then progressed to using the ultrasound to predict a diagnosis and then followed up with an MRI to see whether we really got it right or not. And then finally, we've evolved to where we've been for probably the last eight or nine years, which is using musculoskeletal ultrasound as our primary diagnostic tool and really reducing our reliance on external MRIs. We could spend a whole one hour lecture on workflow considerations and talking about how you implement ultrasound into your practice, but I will just leave you with a, a few of these uh, thoughts if any of you decide to adopt this modality. These are some of the ways in which I use ultrasound in our practice, as I've said, and I've hoped you will appreciate throughout this talk. I really do think that it is the gold standard for the diagnosis of tendinopathies, nerve compressions, and other dynamic orthopedic conditions. I'll often use the ultrasound to supplement patients who come in with a suboptimal outside MRI. We'll perform a dynamic evaluation, and this is particularly useful in areas and things like partial rotator cuff tears, and we'll often find them these partial rotator cuff tears will retract dynamically, indicating there's much more tear propagation than we thought from the static MRI. We can use it to evaluate for nerve subluxations or other just in general equivocal, somewhat suboptimal MRIs. 
Uh, we'll use it in the office as a quick scan tool to evaluate the rotator cuff for end stage DJD of the shoulder. Uh, just prior to arthroplasty, we can on the fly confirm things like Achilles or distal biceps uh, ruptures, which will allow us to uh, proceed straight to setting a patient up for surgery so we don't lose our golden window. I routinely assess all of our soft tissue repairs, usually at about 12 weeks post-surgery, uh, just to see how we're doing, make sure there's no re-rupture, assess the degree of healing, and use it as a tool to help gauge our or where we're going with uh, rehab and how aggressive we can be with a return to sport or other activity. Uh, patients who come in with post-operative complaints, we can use the ultrasound to assess for hardware migrations or failures, or again, putting the probe right over where they say they hurt. And sometimes we'll detect a little, little residual fluid collection, tendonitis, a little bit of tendon non-healing or whatever it is. Uh, we use it clinically to perform stress radiography, particularly for evaluation of the ulnar collateral ligament in the elbow or the hip labrum, as we saw in that example earlier. And of course, uh, I think like most of you, we use it routinely in the office to guide our therapeutic aspirations and injections. This is a 45-year-old police officer who was injured while tracking a suspect out in the desert, uh, presented with shoulder pain, weakness, and difficulty with overhead activities, despite a full course of formal physical therapy period. He'd been treated by an outside orthopedic surgeon for a partial rotator cuff tear as demonstrated on this MRI, uh, the more astute of you will realize that there's probably a significant amount of bursal fluid up here that may indicate leakage of the, the joint fluid and may at least raise suspicion for a full thickness tear. Nonetheless, the study was read out as a partial rotator cuff tear, and that's what he was treated for. We went ahead and ultrasounded the shoulder. And again, just for orientation, we can see the humeral head here. We can see it flattening out into our greater tuberosity. This is our supraspinatus coming across. So this is a long axis view of the supraspinatus and we can see a full thickness defect extending and communicating the full depth of the supraspinatus tendon. If we turn the probe 90 degrees, this is now short axis view or transverse view across our greater tuberosity. And again, we can see the posterior margin of the supraspinatus right here with a nice transition down to the bone. But here we see a full thickness defect. I'm going to go ahead and just blow up the image on the left just so that we can really appreciate this full thickness communicating defect that was not appreciated on the MRI. This was a full thickness rotator cuff tear. The patient underwent an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair and four months later returned to full law enforcement duties. This is the, no, sorry, this is a slightly different patient, but this was it. these are images taken 12 weeks after a standard arthroscopic dual row rotator cuff repair. And here we can see the tendon repair. We can see the suture material passing through the tendon. Again, humeral head, greater tuberosity. We can actually see some of the reflectance from both the medial row and lateral row anchors. And as we go ahead and dynamically evaluate this by rotating the, by internally and externally rotating the patient's arm, we can see the entire rotator cuff construct moving as, a, as an integral unit with no gapping or retraction. So this is indicative of a healing repair at about 12 weeks post-surgery. So I hope I've shown over some of the preceding slides that there really are some very good orthopedic applications for the use of diagnostic and not just therapeutic ultrasound within our office environment. And hopefully that those two uses interact and play with one another. I think we've got a few minutes left, so I'd like to just go through quickly some, uh, what I would consider some interesting use case examples for musculoskeletal ultrasound. This is a 45-year-old female who came to me for a second opinion for her superior left shoulder pain. She'd previously been treated for impingement with the 
typical therapy, non-steroidals, and even a subacromial injection without relief period. She had a negative MRI. Uh, she was somewhat tender over AC joint with a positive cross arm sign. So again, here we are, medial is off to your left, lateral is off to your right. So we can see the clavicle. This is the, the distal clavicle, and this is the, the margin of the acromion. So this is our AC joint. We can see that there is some distension and tenting to the capsule of the AC joint right here. But most importantly, we can see this hyperechoic structure. This represents a torn intraarticular disc. So this patient had a tear of the AC joint disc that was causing all her symptoms that was not appreciated on her MRI. We put the power Doppler on and you can see there's some hyperemia or increased signal flow right here within the, within the joint. This indicates that there's an active process, that there's some active inflammation, uh, and this correlates with the patient's pain. We went ahead and guided an injection right into the AC joint. You can see the, the needle entering, you can see it penetrating the capsule, and you can even see the acoustic rever reverberations from the injectate going in. She got six weeks of complete relief following that diagnostic and somewhat therapeutic injection, and then ultimately underwent an arthroscopic distal clavicle excision with complete resolution of her symptoms. This is a 49-year-old female operating room nurse, uh, was actually injured at work while transferring a patient from the OR table back onto the, the stretcher. Uh, she came in with complaints of just constant, unrelenting shoulder pain. Again, she'd been previously treated prior to the time I saw her, uh, treated for impingement with physical therapy, non-steroidals, and again, a subacromial injection all without relief period. She had a negative MRI and even ultimately underwent a negative MR arthrogram. Uh, and we can see the ultrasound findings confirm that. Again, we have our humeral head, greater tuberosity, supraspinatus, uh, so far looking good. What we're going to focus in here now, and again, as you can see, medial is off to your left, lateral off to your right. So we can just see, start to see the margin of the humeral head. We can see the glenoid. And as we come out here to the scapular body, what we're going to focus in on right here is the suprascapular notch. So maintaining this orientation, we're just going to optimize the image to view our suprascapular notch right here. So again, humerus out this way, glenoid is about right here, and medially is this way. So we can see the floor of the suprascapular notch. We can see the transverse scapular ligament, and we can see this medium-sized calcification within the suprascapular notch causing compression of the suprascapular nerve, pressing it right up against the floor and wall of the suprascapular notch. She underwent an arthroscopic suprascapular nerve release and in fact, literally called me the day after her procedure to tell me that all of her shoulder pain was completely resolved. Here's a, another example. This is a somewhat obvious example of calcific tendinopathy within the supraspinatus. Uh, again, we can see that same image on the ultrasound, humeral head, greater tuberosity. We can see the large calcium deposit, as we see on the plane films, embedded right there within the supraspinatus. Here we are intraoperatively, and you can see our needle guidance. And what we're doing is placing a needle localization wire into that calcium deposit to help us find it at the time of arthroscopy. So this is intraoperatively, but just prior to starting the arthroscopy. Here we are at arthroscopy. You can see inside the joint, uh, relatively benign intraarticular structures. There is a little bit of a contusion pattern in the supraspinatus. As we come up into the subacromial space, we can trace our localization wire down into the bursal surface of the rotator cuff, and it leads us right there to that calcium deposit, allowing us to debride and excise the calcium deposit with minimal tissue disruption. This is what I see as the future for ultrasound technology. The next wave or the next leap in the technology will be the introduction of what we call shear wave elastography. This is an emerging technology that provides information about the inherent elasticity of a tissue by producing an acoustic radio frequency force impulse that is termed an acoustic wind. This generates transversely oriented shear waves propagating through the surrounding tissues. 
in a nutshell, this gives us not just anatomic, but biomechanical information about structures such as tendons and ligaments. So we can determine not only are they anatomically intact, but we can see really whether it's healthy tissue or not and what its overall elasticity is. The next frontier, and we can see this already happening, is the emergence of what we call point of care ultrasound machines, POCUS, point of care ultrasound machines. These are little devices that can be connect, connected to our, our eye thingies or even just small handheld units, again, that we can carry around with us, slip in our briefcases or even our pockets in some cases and take with us wherever we go, wherever our point of care may be. No less than the New York Times has termed ultrasound to become the 22nd century stethoscope, uh, and they predict that in the future, medical trainees and medical students uh, will just be given a point of care ultrasound rather than the more traditional stethoscope that we all grew up with. So I think that concludes our little primer on musculoskeletal ultrasound. If anybody's still awake, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer any questions.